Niagara River Sunrise. Click. One half second. Bobcat walking along a game trail at sundown. Click. One sixtieth of a second. Bison at night in a lightning storm. Click. Six seconds. One evening after the rest of my family was asleep, I turned to the computer calculator and with my shaky memory of sixth grade math, <laughs> began adding up the recorded shutter speeds from each of the 180 photos that appeared in my book, Great Plains, America's Lingering Wild. Two hours later, I had an answer. 10 seconds. <laughs> to be honest, I'm not quite sure why I wanted to do this other than lately I've been thinking a lot about time. It is these 10 seconds that represent a several year journey trying to put a face to the wildlife and native landscapes that still survive in this million square mile region that many of us call home. Today, North America's Great Plains is an altered and fragmented natural landscape. It has been called the continent's most endangered ecosystem. As a photographer, my goal was to try and stitch the ecosystem back together in pictures, shed a light on its conservation challenges, and build appreciation for the wild that still remains in this overlooked heartland. Since that night, I've kept wondering, are those 10 seconds enough time to make a case? As photographers, we think a lot about time. Our craft is to capture time in a box, but in book projects like this, time turns the tables and captures you. There is planning time and research time, field time and waiting time, Travel time, making time, buying time, deadline time, time is money, time away, family time, lost time, other people's time, historic time, here and now time, future time, running out of time. Time follows you like a constant shadow. It consumes you. Looking forward at the beginning of a project, it can seem endless. Looking back after you are finished, you wonder where all the time has gone, as if you had little time at all. For years, this book was a distant dream, but the timing was never right to go at it until one summer when time freed up, proposals were written, and creative support fell together. By fall, I was hitting the road following a schedule that would keep me gone six months a year for the next three plus years. It would be a race against time. On paper, I was to go everywhere in these vast great plains, no piece of prairie sod would be left unturned, but when I showed my field schedule to those close to me, they would smile, call it ambitious, then wish me well. <laughs> I knew their well wishes were genuine, but deep down inside I knew they thought I was nuts. I was going to struggle with time, and they were right. Time was a constant battle in the field. It's easy to lay out a schedule in the comfort of your office while driving down the freedom of the open road with not a care in the world. You figure in early May you will work sage grouse on their strutting grounds in Wyoming, then slip over to South Dakota to photograph eagles at the nest, then slide to North Dakota to catch ducks hatching chicks in the Missouri Coteau. You make phone calls, get permission, pack your bags, and hit the road. But rarely does anything go as planned. In Wyoming, the sage grouse are strutting, but the pickup isn't starting because the alternator quit and took three days to get fixed. In South Dakota, the eagles decided to use another nest this year. In North Dakota, the ducks are hatching, but constant heavy rains make it nearly impossible to photograph in the field. But all those things come with the job. After a lot of years of doing this for a living, you come to expect the unexpected. You adapt, you improvise, and overcome. What's more difficult to overcome is when you get a lump in your throat when your daughter races you down the end of the block as you leave, and you know you will be home just two weeks in the next two months. It's not a big deal when you're single and your address is a P.O. box, but now more hours in the field mean less hours at home. You rationalize being gone by promising your family to never miss birthdays or anniversaries, swim meets or school band performances, Mother's or Father's Day, Thanksgiving or Christmas. You find yourself delaying your trip an extra day just because you don't want to leave. You drive everywhere knowing that even if you're as far away as Medicine Hat, Alberta, you can still be home from anywhere in less than 24 hours. But sometimes you leave from a field location early, knowing that if you stayed, you'd probably make better pictures, but that it's simply time to go home. When the field work finished up, I traveled about 100,000 miles to 12 states and three provinces in Canada and Mexico. 
taken over 30,000 images of everything from tiny minnows to mountain lions. And although I wasn't able to go everywhere I planned, I was able to photograph most of the subjects I had hoped to cover. And sometimes my wife Patty and our girls Elsa and Emmy were able to come along too. Then we began a race against another deadline. During the next several months, writers and editors finished and shaped text, images were selected, layouts were forged, and facts were checked, and things were written and rewritten, and a publisher and printer were brought on board, and then it was out the door just in the nick of time. When the books arrived months later, I gave one to a close friend of mine, Joel Sartori, and he asked me a point blank question. He said, Michael, after all this, as he held the book up in his hand, has time run right out on the Great Plains as an ecosystem? Good question. Over the span of this project, I've learned that the Great Plains and its natural processes need large landscapes over which to function. Yet as an ecosystem, it's been chopped off at the knees in the last century. In many places today, it is in disrepair. The effects of our actions, whether from our lack of knowledge or greed, have resulted in depleted aquifers, invasive species, drastic loss of habitat, the loss of wildlife populations altogether. On the one hand, I told him, I fear that we are in danger of losing a natural heritage that we have barely gotten to know or completely understand. I worry that today, in a more urbanized world, further removed from the land, we increasingly gauge its value only by what we can extract from it for profit, rather than realize the intrinsic value of the land itself. But on the other hand, if there is one thing we can count on as a constant in the Great Plains, it is change. Humans kind has changed this natural landscape more in the last 150 years than it has throughout the rest of its human history, and it hasn't always been pretty. But we are part of the ecosystem too. And we have great capacity for stewardship, restoration, and renewal. And here on the plains, I've seen it firsthand a million times. So as we move forward, the Great Plains will continue to be a critically important working landscape and is increasingly being called to help fuel both our food and fuel energy needs. But will we as a culture also decide to find equal value and virtue in protecting our plains rich natural heritage its amazing natural diversity, and all the services that nature provides. The contents of that book and its 10 seconds of photographs are not sufficient enough to answer these questions, but perhaps it is sufficient enough to keep the conversation going. Time is short. Let's get to it. This is Elsa and Emmy <laughs> on a ranch in uh, western South Dakota, my friend uh, Dan O'Brien's place. Sits right on the edge of the Badlands looking out over Buffalo Gap National Grassland. That was taken during the field work for the project. Um, That's them today. Um, um, about two months ago. And Dennis, I, I'm glad to tell you that Elsa is coming to the University of Nebraska, and she wants to be a kid in fisheries and wildlife. 